great team for you know taking the initiative in not just managing a grants program, which we do, which is really their basic job, but for pulling together a meeting like this, which really, I think, can have a very important political um, impact. We're absolutely delighted to welcome back to the NED our dear friend, Rafael Marques, and thrilled that he's with us. He's, you know, as we all know, one of the great journalists and activists in Africa, and we're very, very happy to have with us this morning the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the, in the Bureau of African Affairs at the State Department, Todd Haskell. And then we're especially grateful to welcome this morning someone who came all the way from Angola for this meeting, which is Ambassador Antonio Lubualo, who is the special envoy for political issues for the government of Angola. And he came for this meeting to have a discussion with Rafael um, and talk about the importance of the Angola issue today. Um, Rafael, I said, is somebody who's very important to us. We just had the meeting of the World Movement for Democracy in Seoul, Korea. And at that meeting, Rafael was given the Democracy Courage Tribute by the World Movement for Democracy. There were two other people given the tribute, um, a, a young Rohingya woman from, uh, from Burma and an activist with the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong. They were both very young and they were both very brilliant and courageous. And they were so good that Rafael speak because we were great you know, uh, support for Raphael within the net. He's been, he's been a fellow here and he's been around for a long time. Our board, uh, Princeton Lyman, who follows Africa for our board, but also Karen Bass, Congresswoman Karen Bass, who is really uh, the woman, the member in the Congress who takes the lead on Africa. is always asking to make sure that Af Raphael is okay. And I say, don't worry, Karen, Raphael is okay. Um, and I think the kind of discussion we're having this morning will underline the fact that Rafael is okay. As we were coming in, the ambassador, Luvalo, picked up our annual report um, and he's going to read it, which is great. But I want to read something uh, from it by way of introducing the meeting this morning. Um, I'm supposed to write an annual president's message for the annual report. So I want to read something in this current report that I wrote at the end. I was talking and this was written at the end of 2014. And I was reviewing the problems that democracy has in the world, but I said that one of the bright spots in the world is the activism, the continuing activism, despite the retreat of democracy and the relative uh, weakness in the West, given the what we call at the NED, the resurgent authoritarians, the activism of civil society. And I just, I, I just want to read what I wrote here. I said, such movements, the civil society movements, and I had mentioned a few of them, will be heard from in the years ahead since they consist of activists who represent a new force in international politics, realistic in their goals and strategies, tech savvy and informed, and committed to staying the course in the fight for human rights, freedom of expression, and the rule of law. One of them is Rafael Marques de Moraes, an Angolan journalist who has been threatened and tortured and has been on trial for reporting on official corruption and trafficking in blood diamonds. And he wrote a book on that. Speaking in memory of some of his slain colleagues, and he was giving this speech, it was the Carlos Cardoso Memorial Lecture at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. And speaking at this, in this lecture of some of his slain colleagues in the, in the continent of Africa, and also on behalf of journalists and human rights defenders throughout Africa. He extolled the courage, the leadership, and the solidarity, this is a quote, that are required to bring down the walls of fear and with them the fear mongers. And he pledged that no politician, however strong and fearsome, will deter me from doing my job. And I think he reflected the spirit of, um, of the kind of activists that the NED is associated with throughout Africa, but really also throughout the world at a very difficult time for democracy, but still one where because of the spirit and the courage and the determination of these activists, 
um, democracy is not really in retreat, but it has a lot of potential to move forward. And it's my great hope that the presence of Ambassador Luvalo here this morning, which I, I find to be just very, very uh, encouraging, will be an indication that the government uh, of Angola is prepared in this era, new era that we're moving into to enter into a dialogue with Raphael on the future of Angola and that it may be ready to embrace more clearly his commitment to fighting corruption and defending human rights and the independence of a strong and vigorous civil society. So I want to welcome you all this morning and now it's my great pleasure to turn the floor over to our board member, the board specialist on Africa, the former U.S. ambassador to Nigeria and South Africa, a very dear friend, Ambassador Princeton Lyman. Yeah, it's on. Thank you, Carl, very much. Thank you and welcome to everyone here for what I think will be a very, very uh, important and lively discussion. Uh, I'll just add to Carl's introduction, uh, and we were talking about this as we came uh, prepared to come into the room, uh, the importance of Angola. Uh, Angola uh, as a country in Southern Africa and a country in Central Africa. I recall that when Senator uh, Russ Feingold, the, who was then the special envoy, for the Great Lakes in his uh, farewell speech when he stepped down from that position, cited Angola's important role chairing the regional group on bringing peace to the DRC. As we all know, Angola has had a very difficult history since independence, a long civil war, uh, millions of landmines still on the ground preventing some of the development of its agricultural potential, its infrastructure. Uh, and also struggling now, I think, with issues of democracy and transparency, as we will, which we will be discussing here today. You've uh, heard uh, Carl talk about Rafael Marques, a very well-known uh, journalist. Uh, he is the director of a, uh, of a program in uh, Angola, Maca Angola, which is an anti-corruption watch. Dog. And as Carl mentioned, he's written extensively, spoken out extensively, sometimes suffered for that, but is a highly respected and popular journalist. Uh, I'm very pleased that we have Ambassador Antonio Luvalo here. He is uh, a scholar diplomat, best kind. Um, he, is the, uh, uh, he is now the ambassador at large for political matters in the office of the president of Angola. He's written a number of books on Angola's role in international relations and peacekeeping and, and other matters. Uh, he, is, he is in charge of uh, outreach on Angola's image uh, in the world. We're delighted to have you with us, uh, Ambassador Voilo. Uh, that will be very helpful. And then Todd Haskell, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, of State in the Bureau of African Affairs. Uh, Mr. Haskell uh, has two responsibilities. He is responsible for our policies in Southern Africa, but he also carries the responsibility generally for public diplomacy in Africa and therefore oversees efforts at uh, political and public outreach in all the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa. He has been in the Dominican Republic. He has served in South Africa. He served in Burkina Faso. So he brings a very important perspective. We'll ask the speakers to speak for about seven, 10 minutes each, and then we'll have a bit of a conversation here, and then we'll throw it open for questions. Uh, I've asked uh, Rafael Marques to uh, start, and so, uh, Rafael, it's over to you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, thank you, Carl, for uh, the kind introduction. Thank you, Ambassador Lyman, for uh, moderating this debate. Uh, good morning, uh, fellow panelists. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is great for me to be back at NED. Um, and every year since 2011, I come back here and I feel so welcomed and at home that I would like to have another fellowship here. <laughs> uh, my presentation focuses on transparency and human rights uh, to make best use of the time available. Uh, last Friday, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted a resolution paving the way for Angola to be promoted from a low to middle income country 
by 2020. This resolution is a cause for celebration by the government, for it is an international endorsement of its stewardship of the country. From 2003 to 2013, the country's oil revenues reached over $450 billion, according to the Angolan economic estimates, and for a decade, the country ranked among the 10 fastest growing economies in the world. Meanwhile, the timing of the UN resolution seems to be a twist of irony for ordinary Angolan citizens when the bust of the oil-fueled economic boom is all too evident on the supermarket's shelves and poverty is on the rise. Food shortages are becoming severe in parts of the country, while in the capital, retailers which are imposing, imposing uh, rationing of certain products. The informal exchange rate of the dollar, which sets the pace of the real economy, is five times higher, five times higher than last year, while the official exchange rate has increased by 60%. Another flag for the general public is the unprecedented downsizing of the private sector employees and the collapse of many private sector companies. Severe bank rationing of withdrawals uh, to address the shortage of, shortages of cash and the crash of the real estate market uh, are other signs for the general population that the country is in serious trouble. What the government did with all the money from the oil revenues remains a central question. A rapid calculation of the price tags of non-national reconstruction projects do not amount to more than 10% of the $450 billion. Nevertheless, Angolans are now faced with a more pressing issue. The economy was anchored on one variable, the oil price. Its collapse caused a crisis in public finances, which has prompted the government's uh, disorientation in economic policies. Why? And let me uh, share a reality check first. The state accounts for 2013 revealed that the Treasury collected dividends equivalent to $954,000 for all the direct shares owned by, the, owned by the state in a total of 37 public and private companies, apart from the national oil company Sonango. According to the account, such profits came only from its shares in three breweries, investments in banks, real estate, transport, and other important sectors yielded no returns. From the investments the government has made abroad in 11 multinationals, including Chevron, British Petroleum, Abbott Laboratories, and Dow Chemical Company, the state accounts uh, reported profits of $110,000. These examples provide an indication that the government has been gambling on its luck. It cannot claim either that it made good investments with the oil money. Even the Sovereign Wealth Fund, family affair. The inexperienced 36-year-old president's son, Jose Filomeno dos Santos, as his playground. What has become a norm of transparency in governance is the nepotism of the president in awarding critical public positions and contracts to his family. The most recent examples are the awarding to the first daughter, billionaire Isabel dos Santos, of the following. The $15 billion urban redevelopment master plan for the capital, Luanda. The restructuring of the national oil company, Sonangol. The commission for the restructuring of the oil sector. And finally, a $650 million contract for Luanda's southern waterfront. This is what I call the transparency of looting. We are to expect nothing else as far as transparency is concerned under the current regime. In 2013, the Constitutional Court ruled that the Parliament has no legal power to have oversight of the government. 
and I quote what the Constitutional Court said, to have powers to call on members of the executive would be the same as having power to call on the president, who is the head of government. And that is unacceptable, I end the quote, uh, said the ruling of the Constitutional Court. How can we talk about transparency without institutional checks and balances? Uh, now I just briefly talk about the human rights situation. In the 80s, under Marxism-Leninism, we had a common joke that if the government ever stopped providing Brazilian soap operas, uh, there would be a coup in the country. Uh, the combination of repression with the politics of venality worked very well for the government and for the entertainment of the urban and peri-urban population. Nowadays, the venality of the leaders who keep looting the country without mercy has become a danger to themselves. The population does not find their venality amusing as it did with the Brazilian soap operas. Therefore, the regime has been undertaking preemptive measures to ensure its impunity. The worn out strategy is to come up with conspiracy theories of acts of rebellion and coup plots. This tactic has three aims. First, in terms of propaganda, it turns the president's liability for being in power for too long, for 36 years, into an asset by portraying him as a constant victim of conspirators. Second, it serves to justify the deployment of its security apparatus to crack down on organized dissent. And thirdly, to neutralize potential leaders who can mobilize anti-regime sentiment. Let us briefly chronologically review three cases that have gripped the nation's attention uh, in the past year as far as human rights are concerned. First, almost a year ago, the authorities arrested activist Marcos Mavungu in the old rich exclave of Cabinda as he came out of mass. He had called for protests against bad governance and human rights abuses in that province, which the government had already banned with stern threats. He is now serving a six-year prison sentence in the local penitentiary convicted of plotting a one-man rebellion against the democratically elected regime of President Duchantos. More than half of Angola's oil output is pumped from Cabinda. It also seemed to be ironic that this was the first province to experience panic as the population rushed to shops to stock up as food shortages and other basic consumer goods became acute. Cabinda's paradoxical situation is also an indictment of the corporate social responsibility of oil multinationals which joined forces with the Angolan regime to maximize the extraction of the resources and cover up the abandonment of the government's main premise, which is to serve the country and its people. Second, there was the massacre of the followers, followers of the Light of the World sect on April 16, 2015 by police and military forces. The government claimed that members of the sect killed nine police officers who attempted to arrest their leader in Mount Sumi in the central highland province of Wambo. According to the deputy general commander of the national police, Commissar Paulo de Almeida, uh, in reaction, the police killed 13 snipers, whom I caught belonging to, belonged to Calupeteca's guard, whose object was to neutralize and destabilize the operation to arrest him I end the quote. Kalupeteka's trial is still ongoing, and so far the government has not been able to show evidence in court implicating those it killed. Nevertheless, even Kalupeteka's eight grandchildren, aged one to seven, had been arrested along with their parents, including sons Juan and Julino Tito, uh, as well as their spouses. Uh, on May 10, so 
almost a month after the incidents. And I quote uh, the Sun's um, statement, they, the police and the security forces, mistreated us and kept call calling us members of Boko Haram. They had not been at the scene, and their crime was simply their kinship to Kalupeteka. His brother and some cousins were also booked as terrorists. Days ago, I had a long conversation with John Kalupeteka, firstborn of the sect leader, who told me how after the massacre, the police in Mount Sumi went on arresting and punishing an individual wearing rubber boots and jackets, a common sort of dress code among local peasants. And anyone wearing uh, those boots and jackets were deep. Just one minute and I will. Um, finally, there's the case also for today. <laughs> Publicly stated that the 15 youth activists were in league with NATO to cause the bombing of Angola by its international body uh, or some of its member countries to overthrow President Tushantos. Ambassador Luvalo's announcement also provided a good illustration of how the aggressor would be the ultimate victim. Uh, through protests, the youth would provoke, according to the statement, the police into killing between 20 to 25 protesters, mainly women and children, which would prompt the international bombing. Uh, the formal charges were much more modest uh, in the way the youth would, would overthrow the president. According to the charges, they would march to the presidential palace where they would burn tires to smoke the president out. Um, so far, the evidence exhibited in court in the ongoing three-month trial is impressive. An edited video in which two defendants are discussing how to react if the police shot at uh, peaceful protesters. Uh, a whiteboard with initials of the president's name, J-E-S, as evidence of the plot to assassinate the president. Here, the authorities' double-faced discourse is very clear. Wild conspiracies are simply for propaganda consumption. Ridiculous charges are for the courts to justify in the imprisonment of the activists. No need for coherence. And I conclude my presentation. In light of this brief narrative, there are three possibilities that might define the course of Angola within a short period. First, there might be a spike in oil prices and the government will continue to run through patronage, repression, and luck. Second, a conversation on the need for a post-Dushanto's peaceful transition and democratic institution building will gain momentum and the authorities will find a dignified solution through dialogue with other sectors of society. And third, we let the situation play out and until, to borrow the title of Shinua Sheba's book, uh, things fall apart. The consequences of the last scenario would be unpredictable and tragic. Now, as I have learned here in DC, one has always to make a recommendation to the US government. <laughs> uh, since the US is the country that pays the most attention to human rights issues in Angola, as there is a paucity of international attention, here is my recommendation. Support a national dialogue in Angola to address the current crisis. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Haskell's presence here today is a good example of a simple but effective gesture that could be undertaken in Angola to start such a dialogue. And just as we were there in the room, Ambassador Luvalo and I came to the same conclusion that we must have this kind of discussion in Angola as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And now, uh, Ambassador Luvalo, please. Thank you. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Todd Haskell, Deputy Secretary of the State for African Affairs, 
Ambassador Priston Lyman, uh, Mr. Carl Grishman, President of the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, Mr. Rafael de Moraes, uh, our lovely love journalist, directors and staff of the National Endowment for Democracy, NED, Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear fellow citizens, ladies and gentlemen, good morning for you all. Uh, I will first like to apologize for my bad English because I'm not an usual English speaker, but I'm speaking via email. Thank you all for this invitation. The Angolan government is looking forward to have uh, activities like this. As we spoke here in the DC or in Angola, we are looking forward to this kind of debates. Uh, I had a presentation, also a presentation of seven minutes to make like Raphael made his presentation, but I think that the crowd here is not interested in hearing my presentation, but is interesting of hearing the answers for the Raphael's questions that he left on air. So I think that this one hour of debate will be very good so as to can understand what is happening in Angola right now. So, as I was telling you, Angola is... Uh, uh, Rafael told us that in Angola at this moment we have uh, food shortages and etc because of the fall of the petroleum prices. That's not 100% truth because Angola is not in crisis. Let's let's put it clear. We are not in crisis. We are living a crisis, and we are living this crisis because of the fall of the petroleum prices. To give you an example, if we were having $100 per barrel, and now we are having $35 maximum per barrel, it tells us that we lost 65% of our uh, international power for having uh, international currencies, uh, namely the US dollar. So that's for, we will have some difficulties of having uh, external products. And as you know, for the last uh, 35, almost 40 years, Angola is a country that lived almost uh, by petroleum. So we found our way to take a step ahead of this problem, that is the diversification of economy. But the diversification of economy will not be made in one, two or three years. For example, to you to have a cow, a cow that can give milk and can give meat, you have to give it a minimum of five years so she can grow and she can give you milk, cheese, etc. and meat. And imagine if you are talking of feeding 24, 24 million people. It's not thinking about me or Raphael. We are thinking about 24 million people. So the, the road is made. We are making our way step by step to the diversification of economy. So, but going to to the questions that Raphael has posed here, very interesting questions. Where the government did with the money of petroleum? What the government did with the money of petroleum? Ambassador uh, Prince Top Lyman told me in the room that he'd been in Angola uh, this year, uh, 30 years uh, be, uh, after being there for the first time, and he noticed the changes in Angola. What the government did with the money? The government built new cities, Rafael. The government built new roads. The government built new hospitals. Uh, I, I think that we cannot think that the, the thing that the government made from 2002 until today, uh, 13 years, are nothing. They've made a good uh, effort to, to provide a good life to Angolans. And, I think that we have been having some problems here in passing the government's message here uh, outside Angola. Because we have voices like Rafael that does his job, uh, a very good job, but we need also to, to provide you data about what the government has been doing. So I never heard Rafael uh, speaking about the 7 million Angolans who attend school for free. I never heard that. Seven million Angolan who go to school without paying anything, children. Huh? I, I speak seven million, it can be more. I never heard Rafael speaking about the 10 million Angolans or more that have 
health uh, for free, health provided by the government. So the government is doing a lot with the money of petroleum, a lot with our reserve of petroleum. But I've also noticed one thing, and I think that is important to explain that. If we have the petroleum barrel in cost of $100, it doesn't mean that the Angolan government will stay with the $100, Rafael. The money will serve to pay the company who works with the petroleum, to pay the dealers of the petroleum, to pay Wall Street, to pay a lot of people. The money doesn't stay all with the Angolan government. So that numbers that you gave, we have to analyze, uh, to think on them, because not all of the money of the petroleum stays with the government. We have to give the companies, etc. But let's also reflect uh, on some stuff you said about uh, the president's sons, etc. I don't think that for the fact of a person being a president's son makes him less citizen than the other citizens. So what will the president's son around the world do? They will study and then what? They will stay at home? President George uh, W. Bush was president. His father was president. Nobody told him that he cannot be president because his father was president. That's, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a way to see the things. But if you, wa you want to go to that way, Rafael, I'll give you one example that I think can serve to you so you can not talk more about this uh, stuff of president's sons being in some, uh, in some, in some uh, cabinets. In 2009, I'll give you an example of a country that is not an African country, it's not in Africa, it's not an undevelopment country, it's a country, a big country. I'll give you the example of France. In 2009, uh, Jean Sarkozy, at a time with 23 years old, he was appointed by his father's government as CEO of La Defense. I think that many people here know La Defense. La Defense it's the, bigger, the biggest economical center of France uh, with a budget, an annual budget of 1 billion euros. So for five years, he will have with him 5 billion euros to run the president's son. At the time, Jean Sarkozy had 23 years old. So nobody made a scandal because Jean Sarkozy was appointed. He was appointed because he was capable of being appointed to that post. He, he's a human being. If he has capabilities to, to take that post, why we will not give them uh, the chance to show they work, the chance to show why they've studied for just because they are president's son? But it's not the only, uh, the only example. I can give you more, Rafael. He were here, here in the United States of America. People work, people have made their lives besides being families of presidents or brothers or sisters, etc. You had uh, the 64th uh, general prosecutor of the United States, Robert Francis Bobby Kennedy. He was brother of President Kennedy. Nobody made a scandal of it here in America. He was brother of president. He has capabilities of being the general attorney. Why not? So I, I, I don't see senses of things that happen in Europe, here in America, cannot happen in Africa, just not in Angola, in other countries. Because if people have capability, let them do their job. Uh, my time is, is ending. I think we will have time to speak with the crowd. Um, also about the the fiscalization of the national budget. That's not certainly, uh, that's not an absolute truth, Rafael, that the National Assembly cannot make a fiscalization on the national uh, budget. It's not true. Because every year you, we see... Sorry, rec I did not say about the budget. Mm. Call on the government, to oversight of the government. But different. you, if uh, every week you have uh, ministers going to the parliament, to give uh, satisfaction about how they, 
they run the, the country. That's not a, a, a thing that we have to see in the top, in the level. We just not have to see the president. We will see Angola as a whole, not just one person's country, because Angola is not president, uh, presid a one man's country. It's 24 million Angolans who are living there. So I think that when Rafael tells us that uh, we have uh, 15 young, uh, 15 Angolans that been arrested for been reading a book. That's not true. That, uh, excuse me, Rafael. I have to tell you that's not true. These Angolans were arrested after our in, our security services made a, a series of work, and they conclude that the plans that these Angolans were having will make, uh, how can I tell it in English, uh, the preparatory acts to a massive sublevation. And Ambassador Princeton Lehman, let me tell you that. If that meeting that that 15 Angolas were having, if that happened here in the United States, the security services would have the same, the same uh, action or worse than the Angola security services had. Because I can remember you, Rafael, you are laughing, but this is, this is too serious. I can remember you. On the 29th of August 2015, here in the United States, the Department of Justice informed that three individuals were convicted to 12 years in jail because of attempting of doing something using uh, weapons of mass destruction here in the United States. Uh, Corey Williamson, 29 years old, Brian Cannon, 37 years old, and Terry Peace, 47 years old. They were chatting on the internet and discussing how they can use weapons of mass destruction to go against the federal government here in the United States. They were arrested. So why free individuals can attempt against the security of the biggest nation in the world and 15 individuals cannot attempt against the security of the Angolan government. So that's not a matter to, to us as civilians to discuss. That's matters of the security forces to discuss. That's, that's our matters of the justice to discuss. So that's not my time for sure. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Ah, OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK, two, two minutes, OK. Uh, one more. Uh, thing I want to tell about uh, Marcos Mavungu and uh, the massacre that Rafael told us uh, about Calupeteca. There was no massacre, Rafael, because the, the accusation that people made that the police killed 100, 200 people, never, 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 even the police or the political parties that accused the police of killing the people, we never found their bodies. You saw the bodies of the 100 person who were killed? Never. You cannot hide 100, person, 100 persons in one, two or three days. We cannot do that. In modern times, you, you cannot do that. This uh, Kalupeteka uh, spiritual guide, he was telling people to leave city to live in the mountains. So they lived all their lives away to live in the mountains. And the police uh, told that we are not living in the Stone Age. We have a state, we have a government who can provide health, who can provide education. So people should not live in the mountains. They have to live on the cities, on their homes. So. In that process, to the police telling people to leave that scene, some police were killed, and we saw the police uh, body. And some, I believe that some civilians were also killed, I believe that. But we cannot prove. At this moment, the, the question is in, in the courts. The courts are, debate, uh, are debating. Mr. Kalupeteka has his uh, uh, lawyer. Yeah? The, the prosecutor of the government is presenting his version of the facts, and we will wait. Another problem that we are having is that people are so impatient with the Angolan authorities that they don't have, they don't give time to the Angolan authorities to speak or to 
to make their job. If the justice is working, let's give justice time to work on the cases of the 15 plus 2, of the Mavungu case, of the Kalupeteka case. Let's, let's give Angolan justice time to work. And just for finish, Ambassador Princeton Lehman, I want also, also to, to tell my friend Rafael that when we are discussing uh, human rights in Angola, we cannot just, we cannot see that as a personal thing. I understand that Rafael is a human being as us, and he has his feelings because he's been convicted, he thinks that that's it, that is injustice. But how many people in the world or here in America have been convicted and they think that that was unfair? The courts will say, the Supreme Court will say if your trial was fair or unfair. But when we are discussing this stuff, we cannot discuss it with emotion. We have to discuss it seriously because we are speaking about a government that was elected by the people of Angola and has until 2017 to complete the mandate. If me or Rafael, if we want to criticize more, we have to join a party, Rafael. Let's make a party of both of us, <laughs> our own party, and we will have, uh, we will undergo to the election in 2017. And who think, who knows that if we can make it to the parliament and we will pass our message uh, to the people or to the United States government or stuff like that. So thank you, Ambassador Lyman, and I think that we have time to to speak also with the crowd that is here. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Princeton Lehman, just uh, uh, one minute, please. Uh, sorry, uh, our ambassador didn't came because because of this postponement. He has already a meeting today in New York, so he is out of town. But I think he will. He is with us, and he sends uh, a salute to Ambassador Lehman and to Ned also, and he thanks the the invitation for being here. No, thank you. And we know he was uh, tied up, but we're very happy to have you there. Uh, we have two things uh, developing to, to carry the same debate to, uh, to Luanda and to see a new party form. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me turn to Todd uh, Haskell and get your perspective and that of uh, the U.S. government. Thanks, Todd. Great. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Lyman, and uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Luvalu and, and uh, Senore Marques and distinguished guests. I particularly want to thank the National Endowment for Democracy for hosting this. You know, I woke up on Tuesday morning very excited to uh, come down here and, and speak. And of course, we had the, the snow and the rain. So I really appreciate that uh, we found a new time to do it. And obviously, we have a, a great turnout. And I also really appreciate the commitment to do this again sometime in Angola. Um, there's many advantages to doing this in Gola, not least that you probably won't have to worry about snow on that one. So <laughs> we can look forward to that. Um, last November, I had the honor uh, to represent the United States in Angola's 40th anniversary of independence celebration here in Washington. Um, and uh, this is an extremely important relationship for us. Uh, I was talking about this earlier. Angola is only one of only three partners that we have on the continent, the other two being Nigeria and South Africa, with which we have a strategic partnership framework uh, agreement. So, so in 2014, we had the first high-level strategic dialogue with the Angolan government. And three months ago, we, we committed to build on that strategic partnership framework with the first ever bilateral dialogue purely on the issue of uh, human rights, a human rights sub-dialogue. Since establishing diplomatic ties in 1993, our relationship has been forged not only through strong trade, which is very important, but also with a commitment to regional peace and security. And Angola has shown able leadership in the Great Lakes and in the Gulf of Guinea. It's worked to prevent conflicts and promote peace, security, and stability. And I can also note Angola's role as a chairman of the Kimberley process and as a member of the UN Security to commercial and security opportunities to strengthen our foundation. Together, we've tackled social and economic development with projects promoting education and health. And we continue to seek ways to constructively engage on a variety of issues, including human rights. Like the United States, Angola will hold presidential and parliamentary elections in the near future. 
And as the elections approach, the United States will continue to support free and fair elections. Freedom of expression for all the candidates and the importance of a transparent electoral process. Free and fair elections are a key part of a strong democratic governance, but there's many elements, including universal human rights of freedom of speech, press, and assembly. And we advocate for human rights because we believe that these principles are critical to any countries, but also to Angola's continued stability and prosperity. Last year, as I noted, I co-chaired um, the nearly two-day-long human rights sub-dialogue along with Deputy Assistant Secretary Stephen Feldstein from the State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And we met in a small room uh, with Minister Mangera, uh, the Minister of Justice and Human Rights from Angola, and went over in detail a whole variety of different uh, human rights issues in our country. It was, um, it was unlike anything in my experience, an extremely robust and in-depth and frankly frank uh, dialogue on topics from freedom of religion to trafficking in persons and also the Angola 15 plus 2 court case. Um, I was impressed uh, with Ma Minister Mangueira's willingness to participate in such an open and at times difficult conversation. It's a level of engagement that I think is critical in seeing uh, progress. And frankly, I, I will say again today, I'm impressed by the willingness of the Angolan government to send a representative to participate in this forum. I think it's extremely important that there be a dialogue on these issues. The engagement of the United States on the issue of human rights is not just limited to government-to-government -government dialogue. In fact, as part of the human rights sub-dialogue, uh, we hosted a meeting with non-government civil society partners soliciting their views on the state of human rights in Angola. And I would note that Minister Mangera participated in that dialogue as well. Further, through our USAID mission, We've implemented programs in Angola focused on the transparency of public finance, encouraging Angolan youth to participate in peaceful political dialogue. Just last week in Angola, in Luanda rather, our, with support from our embassy, a local organization supported by a small grant, conducted training for local NGOs there on best practices in public communication. And today, over 20 journalists will participate in a virtual training hosted at our embassy in Luanda in collaboration with the largest journalist union in Luanda. We're inviting teachers and entrepreneurs and government officials and scientists and other Angolans to participate in exchange programs where they come to the United States to share their ideas and to learn new techniques and practices. And we're collaborating with Angolan organizations and institutions to strengthen English language training and promote an understanding of American culture and values. And we actively seek out young Angolan leaders through many exchange programs including the Mandela Washington Fellowship uh, as part of President Obama's Young African Leadership Initiative. It's this generation that the future of Angola uh, rests, and, and those folks will be the ones who are determining its future. But while much progress has been made over the past 40 years, the only true guarantee of lasting success will continue, will promote democratic principles. In the 40 years since independence, Angola has experienced many challenges. There's a multi-decade long civil war and several economic downturns. And these experiences, we believe, have shaped how Angola faces present challenges. And obviously the current oil price is having a dramatic effect on the country. The government has addressed the fiscal challenges by working to close the budget gap and to close subsidies. Neither of these are easy tasks, and continued efforts on diversification and strengthening existing institutions can only help Angola weather these challenges. But in addition, in addition to establishing strong democratic institutions, Angola's progress will depend on unleashing economic growth, and that requires trade and investment. Both foreign and Angolan investors require an open business climate that fosters innovation and startups and simplifies transactions. And there has to be transparency in the financial sector and a commitment to strong institutions to promote success across all sectors. I acknowledge the commitment of the Angolan government in regards to freedom of press. A free press is a critical component of any vibrant democracy. And in, it, in that light, we're concerned about instances of curtailment of freedom of the press in Angola, specifically reports that journalists, and we have examples of this right here in this room, are at times imprisoned and intimidated for doing their jobs 
and are repressed and influenced in more subtle ways. We're also concerned that Angola's defamation laws can be and at times are used to prevent open dialogue in Angola, including dialogue on governance and political issues. Social media is a critical platform. It's growing more important every day for facilitating open discussions everywhere. And the government's recent consideration of plans to limit free speech on social media are worrisome and are of concern to us. The Angola legal system formally protests the right to freedom of assembly and association. And as President Dos Santos said during Angola's National Day, democratic principles remain the best path for all countries in the world, and freedom of assembly and association are bedrock democratic principles. We couldn't have said that better ourselves, and we think it's important that those principles are carried forward. Given the Angolan government's public commitment to these fundamental freedoms, it's imperative that Angolan citizens be granted the rights to participate in civil disobedience in a meaningful and constructive way. Though legal demonstrations and political social, or rather through legal demonstrations, political, social, and cultural opposition, using the mechanisms established by the Angolan Constitution, and that those in leadership are held accountable. There's a role for all of us in working towards democracy, peace, and prosperity for Angola. I note President Obama has said that Africa is on the move. Clearly, Angola is on the move as well. Positive change has been seen over the past 40 years. And now's the time to focus on what we can do together to keep the momentum going in a direction that promotes the very democratic principles that I just quoted President Dos Santos having said. I look towards the stronger collaboration between our two countries, yes. government to government, but also with civil society and with the free press. In the long course of history, our two countries are still young. And I hope that we continue to build bridges of uh, friendship as we move forward. We applaud the progress that Angola has made and the, and the bright future for the country. But we urge a continued focus on putting the democratic principles and human rights, freedom of expression, and transparency to overcome the present challenges. Thank you very much. Let me just take a couple of minutes. I just returned from Khartoum, uh, where Sudan is struggling with the concept of a national dialogue uh, and with the, the ideas of transformation. But there, is a great, there are a great many problems there. And one of them is the difficulty of an existing regime to undertake a real democratic transformation because of insecurities, about worry, about the outcome of it, treating it as a zero-sum game. And that's part of the problem. That's why protesters get arrested or even as they carry out the national dialogue in, in Sudan, they're arresting civil society people and intimidating journalists. And it seems to me that the, the, the fundamental issue, the underlying issue in, in, in the debate is how does a country like Angola, and perhaps the opportunity comes with this economic crisis, to undertake the kind of dialogue and movement that can move to some of the things that uh, uh, Todd talked about to a more, much more democratic, much more open system without people fearing it's a zero-sum game, that it's we're in or we're out. And, that. and there are a lot of countries who have done it, Chile, South Africa. South Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia. It can be done, and I wonder if there is an opportunity in a real rich dialogue, but it can't only be one of those national dialogues. It's also got to have political commitments to, to, to begin to move in that kind of a transition. So get comments from both of you for a couple of minutes, and then I'll throw it open. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Todd Haskell. Thank you, Ambassador Princeton, and thank you again, Rafael. And thank you to the crowd. That I think you you, are, you want to to make your questions. I think you'll make it, uh, Ambassador Princeton. Uh, I think that yes, we can have this way in Angola. So, so you you've mentioned the 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 Asian tigers, eh? the Philipp the Singapore, etc., that have made their they they way. Uh, have made, have built their way of development, a way of the petroleum. Eh? Uh, and I think that 
we have we are now struggling to fight the Dutch disease, as you know, the Dutch disease caused by the dependence of petroleum. And I think that the National Development Plan 2013-2017 will give us ways that Angola can find this this good path to to look into the solutions of uh, having internal uh, responses to deal with this uh, crisis on the petroleum market. I think that all these recommendations about democracy uh, made uh, by Undersecretary Todd Haskell, uh, and, <coughs> sorry, and he, uh, Undersecretary also quoted President on his speech on, of the 11th of November. I think that the Angolan government is the first uh, is the first entity that wants to to make the country democratical. It's the first. And we are struggling to enforce democracy in our country. We know it's a long way. We are a nation with 40 years old and just 13 years in peace. So we have lived difficult moments in the 70s with the South African invasions, in the 90s with the internal war. And I think that now we are in the way of making a lot of internal challenges. And I think that the government is showing signs uh, that uh, it's committed on maintaining democracy, on maintaining the respect on, on human rights. Uh, last visit of Minister Mangera here at the United States, I think that it was also approved uh, of, of our uh, open mind spirit. So I think that uh, with the collaboration of all Angolans, uh, Rafael, <coughs> me, the other Angolans who live here in our big diaspora, we can make a good and a strong country in Africa and in the world. Rafael, you can, please. Uh, it's always uh, interesting when we discuss with Ambassador Luvualo. Everyone gets to uh, expect um, great statements that... Um, and just to, in terms of dialogue, I think the major issue is the cover-up of corruption. Okay. And that's what scares the government, because the government, the president in particular, doesn't want to stop that. Had he stopped that, had he felt that his family has enough and those around him, dialogue would be much easier. But all these measures of repression are essentially to cover up and to ensure his impunity. And it's not possible to have dialogue and ensure impunity at the same time. And just what uh, Ambassador Hia said uh, on the great things that the government has done, there has been one hospital built since independence in 2006. It's the Luanda's Provincial Hospital. And that hospital collapsed. No, let, Rafael, let, sorry, let just, sorry. No, no, please, sorry, sorry, sorry. I sorry. didn't interrupt no, you. No, 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 no. Uh, one hospital which collapsed because it was bad, badly built, the Luanda Provincial Hospital uh, by the Chinese. And we get to the other question. Uh, there is a conversation since the 80s, and it's always in the government speeches, the diversification of the economy. And one of the ways to do that is through agriculture. We have now a situation, and I have been documenting that, and it's very well known in Angola, that most of the arable land is being given, awarded, to senior members of the government who also go and collect huge loans from state banks and others and don't do anything with it. Uh, the most recent case I raised was the president's son-in-law taking 76 square kilometers of land and a governor who took 300 square kilometers of land in just one province. There will be no diversification of the economy with the centralization of the economy uh, by leading members of the government who are at the same time public officials and are the top business people in the country. They do not open the market because of that, because it's easier for them to engage in self-dealing. Their ministers, their business people, they deal with themselves all the time. And that's what is shocking the economy. As for the food shortages, there are pictures everywhere in the social media of announcements made 
on uh, supermarket uh, um, on stories uh, of lack of milk, lack of this. And I personally live in Angola, and I go shopping and I see what is missing in the supermarkets. So just to say, and again also the issue of having 7 million Angolans attending school for free. The education system is free in Angola. The health system is free. What is the quality that is provided to the children? What is the quality of the health system? That is a problem. And I tell you, I live next to the pediatric hospital, and it's the only one we have in, uh, in Angola. In, uh, in, uh, in the city, I'm talking about hospital. You have pediatric you're lying, you're units. Lying. You have pediatric units, you know. But in Angola, pediatric hospital, you have one. Uh, in Luanda, I'm sorry. Rafael, so, I want to open it up in a minute. It's, yeah, let's, uh, let, let's okay. open up the discussion. Okay. But and again, just to f finalize a point here, when you speak about the president's children also having the same right, what you have here is also laws that should be followed and processes of transparent tender. And I've clearly mentioned the tenders that have been awarded to the president's daughter. On what capacity is she the expert on oil to restructure the old sector? On what capacity is she the expert to redevelop Luanda City? On what capacity is she an expert to basically gobble up all the major contracts that are available by the government? Is she the only one who went abroad to study? I don't think so. Uh, I'm going to open it up, and you'll have a chance, to, I'm sure, in the questions. And you've all been very patient. I'm going to take three questions at a time, so we get as many people. Please make your questions questions, and not uh, more than that. Yeah, but start with Ambassador, the Ambassador, yes. Ambassador please, 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 just before opening, and I, I, I thank you for your patience, just one minute right. to, to tell this. Uh, Raphael, it's what I have been told since the beginning of this interesting meeting. This that we are having here today is the example of what we had for the past 30 years. It's people coming here abroad and telling big lies, like this one that Rafael is telling here. Big, big lies. Rafael told us that since 1975 in Angola was just built one hospital, that's a big, big a national-wide uh, lie. That's a lie of the size of the United States of America. That's a very big lie. Just tell me which hospitals were built. I will tell you. In Zaire, we have built a new big hospital. Zaire, Provincia do Zaire, Provincia do Zaire, Municipio do Soio. You can Google it. We have built a big hospital in province of Moshiku, Provincia do Moshiku, Cidade do Luana. City capital, we have built a big hospital. We have built a big, big hospital in Cabinda, built by Chevron. Chevron, the oil company here from the United States of America, has built a big blue hospital. I've been there, a big blue. You can Google it now since you are making your questions. We and have built. The government no, <laughs> yes, no. You told here that in Angola we have just built one hospital since 1975. Wait, Rafael, I didn't interrupt you. I think you open the point. Thank you. So, and the, the only pediatric hospital is in Luanda, in all country. It's a big lie, Rafael. My mother worked in the pediatric hospital Pioneiro Zeca, na cidade do Lubango. It's a big pediatric hospital. In Luanda, you have other pediatric hospital. And you in have Luanda, hospitals. Sorry, you in have Luanda, hosp we have one. And we, Rafael, we have the maternity of Augusto. Rafael, Maria. I didn't I interrupt you. All right. And I, we I have, think, uh, I think, no, 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 I think the point just, just, just one, 30 okay. seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> the president's daughter, Rafael, is always taking things personally. You, not, you cannot take these things personally because we are speaking about a country. You are, you told that the president's daughter, she, she is not economist, she's, I think that when we speak about uh, someone, I, I think that she, uh, the, the, the companies that concur to that con con public, mm, public, public bid. yes, public bids, 
I think that it's not a person, it's companies. And, and I think in some cases, international companies. So it's not that person. Returning to, uh, 10 seconds, Ambassador. Returning, <laughs> returning to that example I gave you about Jean Sarkozy, this young man that was appointed CEO of the biggest economical center in France to run 1 billion euros per year, he had 23 years old, and at the time, he was making the second year of his degree in uh, uh, his law degree, and he was repeating the second year. But no one say that he was mathematical, he was, uh, he was appointed, and people just accepted it. Okay, I'm going to take three questions. I'm going to start with the gentleman here. Please make them specific, and and then we'll give you yes, a chance. Yes. Yeah. Serafin Oliveira with uh, a friend of Angola. Listen to uh, the uh, Ambassador Luvali, uh, Luval. I am um, under the impression that the Angolan government is more uh, looking for a win-lose uh, paradigm. Let's make it clear. Uh, I, I really want a question. I'm sorry. My question yeah. is, how, what the, uh, leverage has the, the Angola, the, the, um, the U.S. government has to, um, in order to help Angolans to a kind of convene a, 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 a national a conference with the participation of uh, all the living uh, forces in, in the country to the to the side of the, the the future of the country in a very say um, democratic or uh, peaceful way. That's my question. Thank you very much. I think someone way back there, gentlemen, I see. The lady, all the way at the back, all the way at the back. And then there's someone right on, right there, the gentleman in front of her. That'll be the three, then I'll come back to another round. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is to the ambassador. In your response ambassador to... Lima? No, no, to you, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so in your response to Rafael's uh, presentation in relation to the 15 activists that were arrested, you said that the government or the security had done its own investigation before uh, they were arrested. So I'm just wondering why did it take five months to press charge against them if you had so much evidence to put them in prison? So that is my question. Thank, Thank you. you. And then the gentleman there, and then I'm going to come back on the second round. And please identify yourself. I'm sorry. So Michael Allen with the, uh, with the endowment. The ambassador has twice now cited the example of uh, Nicolas Sarkozy's appointment of his son Jean to La Défense in 2009 as an example of, uh, as an attempt to justify kleptocracy and uh, nepotism. However, what you didn't say is that the appointment was revoked after a media clamor by an independent press, by the opposition, and also by threats of court proceedings. So in fact, he was forced to withdraw his nomination and he never took up that post. So in fact, what your example emphasizes is the importance of precisely the ind independent press and the division of powers, separation of powers that Rafa so uh, eloquently demanded. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. And so uh, I think, Todd, the, one of the questions was for you and then a question for the ambassador and then I'm gonna open it up for another round. Okay. Um, you asked about the, the U.S. role. I, I think the U.S. Uh, across the continent has promoted uh, the development of democratic institutions and uh, respect for freedom of the press, freedom of assembly. President Obama has been very clear about this. Uh, the, the phrase that one hears him quoted all the time is the need for strong institutions, not strong men. Um, so we are looking towards a time. I'll be honest, with that very thought in mind and, and the, the efforts that we do make to promote dialogue, I'm a little bit hesitant to talk for too long here because I think we're having a pretty good dialogue <laughs> going on. Um, I think Ambassador Lehman said it reminded him of a Republican debate at this point. But um, <laughs> so we'll, um, with that, I'll, I'll close except to say I think we need more discussions like this. We need them taken more broadly. And I welcome the conversation you guys had before uh, the meeting about taking this conversation to Angola itself. Okay. Thanks. Uh, you want to answer the yes, the two questions. Way. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, to the young lady in the back, she told uh, if the security, uh, the, the security forces that uh, have made the, the detention or the arrestment, why they took 
five months to arrest if they had proofs, huh? right? If I no, to, press to press charges, yes, because as you know, uh, uh, I kind of presentation of the candidates, the the republic candidates, uh, they were speaking to a journalist, three or four of them. And one told about this case that is happening between uh, CIA and Apple because of the some uh, unlock some cell phone or some stuff like that. And I remember him telling that when we are dealing with uh, security measures, we have to be very prudent. We have to, to, to be very, very prudent. So I think that when the, the, these 15 elements were arrested, the, the judicial system of Angola gives time so that they can be arrested and then can be presented charges. And Rafael, you know that. That's not a lie. You know that. The, the judicial system, the Angolan laws, give us the, this time. And I also, I, I, I always I like to make some parallels. These three individuals that were arrested here in the United States, they were arrested on the 15th of February 2014. And the charges were just presented on the 29th of August. So they've been, this is, this is security system, so this is uh, parallel in the world. Uh, uh, Mr. who asked from NED asked about, uh, uh, told about uh, Sarkozy's son resigned after the press made uh, uh, some pressure. Yes, he, he resigned, but he was appointed. The question is not uh, if he is appointed or he resigned. He was appointed, he assumed the job. The, uh, uh, about the question of the free press, we in Angola, we have a free press. We have a free press, and Rafael knows it. And the question is, in Angola, we don't have a professional press because almost uh, of the newspaper, we have 15 newspapers all weeks in Angola, 15, 10 plus 5 weekly newspapers. But the problem is that this newspaper, they are not professionalized. So they write to attack you, then to, to write uh, generally. So we have to make our press more professionalizing. Um, and the, 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 the free expression in Angola is guaranteed. I can assure you that. Let me Let take another sorry. round. Oh, sure, Rafael, yeah. quick. Yeah. Uh, just uh, to go back on the 15, um, on the evidence presented. Yes, it, it's OK. Ah, OK. okay. Uh, I have to say that one of these evidence collected by the state security is that there was a government in waiting to take over. And my name is on that list, which was a discussion on Facebook that had nothing to do with the youth. And days ago, I was summoned, uh, I was already out of the country, to go and testify in court through a TV advertisement, not through the normal legal channels and an editorial in the state newspaper. That is the evidence the state security had on the 15th. A government which they didn't draft, it was a list discussed on the internet among individuals, some lawyer who had his followers uh, given names of who would be ideal for the government. Uh, that list was then used as evidence that the youth had even prepared a government. And it is a joke. And in court, the very same individual has already said it was a joke and it was not drafted by the youth. But there is an insistence, and this is the 30 years Mr. Louvoilo says. For 30 years uh, since independence, Angola has had embassies abroad to tell what the government, to give the government's view on what is happening. What there wasn't was a civil society that could also present a different version of what was happening in the country. And that's what the government is struggling with, with a different opinion. And when you say there is free press in Angola, that is not true. I'm not allowed to speak for the state newspaper for which I had worked for early in my career. I'm not allowed to speak on the public television. You can go to debates at forums like this. I cannot attend forum organized by the government. That is true. I was in court to 
and you say it is normal, there is normal proceedings. I went to court to see the case of the 15. I was not allowed in court. I had to leave, and I left normally. And the next thing there was, there was propaganda on the state television saying that I tried to falsify documents to enter uh, the court and to be in the audience when the court, the trials are supposed to be free, uh, open to the public. So that is a good example of how it is very difficult for the government to sustain a dialogue with other sectors of society. I'm going to take just a couple more questions because we're running out of time. Gentlemen here. I'm in my grid and the Challenge Corporation. Um, my question is, will it be possible for Ned in cooperation with the two Angolan speakers to make available their written texts. We didn't get an opportunity to see the ambassador's text, and I think that Raphael was stopped before he got to the end, and perhaps put it on the website. Okay, okay. that's that's, 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 that's it. Uh, let me take a couple more gentlemen right on the aisle there. Thank you. My name is Ni Akwete. I'm with the African Immigrants uh, Caucus here. My question is for the Deputy Assistant Secretary. You just said that um, across Africa, the U.S. promotes democracy. I'd like to respectfully take issue with that. When I look at Egypt, when I look at Rwanda, when I look at Uganda, when I look at uh, Ethiopia, and this is currently, and if you go back in history, there are many instances so I, I hate to take it away from, uh, from um, uh, Angola, but I'd like to challenge the, the position that the U.S. promotes uh, democracy. There have been many dictators in Africa that have been supported, and if you can address that, thank you. Okay, and then I can take one more. I think there's a lady right here. And then, and then I apologize. That we'll yes, hi. I'm with the Joan Maurer with the Broadcasting Board of Governors. We run Voice of America. Um, I'd like to um, find out uh, if there's any possibility of opening up the radio airwaves in Angola. So, for instance, in in, uh, in most African countries, um, we have our own FM frequencies, and we're able to broadcast in those countries. Um, and it's a, it's a really great thing between the United States and, and those countries. And also, if there's a way of, of extending private f radio's frequencies outside Luanda. So in other words, more private stations outside Luanda. Um, thank you. Thanks very much. I'm going to start with Todd, and you can use this as a closing, closing. statement oh, okay. as well. Okay and then move straight down. Okay. Thanks okay. very much. Todd? Um, well, first of all, let me, let me thank you all for, for hosting this. I think this is a, a really important effort to bring people together and have these kind of conversations. Um, and that, I guess, does relate to the question that was posed. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in state and, and in the Bureau of African Affairs and in cooperation with the White House and President Obama, we've identified uh, U.S. goals uh, in Africa. Um, there's obviously a variety of them, but the, you can put them in three words, which is uh, peace, prosperity, and democracy. Um, and that's what we try to achieve throughout the continent. I think at times there can be conversation with us about our uh, tactics. Uh, sometimes it's better to do things publicly, other times it's better to do things privately, but everything that we are doing, that the United States is doing in Africa can be capture in those three words, peace, prosperity, and democracy, and that's at the center of our policy. I think uh, today, um, certainly our relationship with Angola uh, spans all three of those things. Yes. Um, and uh, we, we talk to them about their regional role as an important actor in terms of peace and security on the continent. We, we certainly have an a important trade relationship with Angola. But we also very vigorously engage in a uh, dialogue about democracy and human rights. And, and we have differences. Um, and, and we make those differences clear. And frankly, I think in our conversations, there have been times where we've come to learn things about the Angolan point of view, but frankly, that they've learned to some things from us as well. And I think we're, you know, today is an evidence of, 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 of moving in the right direction. That's not unlike our relationship with other countries on the continent where we have a variety of different factors engaging our relationship. 
But I can assure you, we are engaged in a human rights dialogue with every country um, on the continent, and we think it's really important. It's, you know, um, at times, I think African leaders are wondering what the heck we're doing, why we care about these things. But for the most part, they have come to understand that that's who we are. And, and those are the kind of conversations that are extremely important to us, and that's what the United States stands for. So that's how we continue. Again, thank you uh, to the National Endowment. Thank you, Todd. Ambassador, please. No, Rafael, since you're at home, you can now finish. take my But anyway. And I, I, I would take this opportunity again to speak of the 15, uh, because one of the young uh, activist was finally convicted in a summary trial within the trial uh, last week uh, for uh, contempt of court because he disagreed with the way the judge was treating his father. And that is the only evidence that was presented in court that very publicly that these youth were in league with NATO. And no evidence so far, the trial has been going on since uh, for three months now, four. No evidence has been presented in court that they have been in league with NATO. That was pure propaganda, uh, to clarify that. And the other aspect that is also important just to note uh, as an end is uh, the opening of airwaves. Uh, it remains a problem in Angola because to this day the government has not allowed the Catholic radio to extend its signal to the provinces through F FEM repetitors. And uh, the radios that have received license to operate beyond Luanda are those uh, that belong to the individuals connected to the power structures. And that is a reality. And on the newspapers, yes, there are 15 titles. But if one look at the ownership of those titles, uh, the majority of them belong actually to the system, apart from two or three, which also in Luanda we have 6 million people. These 15 weekly newspapers do not print altogether even 100,000 copies. So they do not reach out the rest of the country. And when we talk about freedom of expression, freedom of press, we must always take into account that it's not just Luanda or a few individuals who speak out that represent Because when we discuss it in Angola, we will sort this out. <laughs> Please don't take those practices from our debates back up. Uh, Ambassador, well, you have the final word. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think that the time is not sufficient. So uh, just to be short. Uh, we had some countries abroad supporting their plans, but that is another talk. Uh, and responding on that, that government that Rafael told that it was someone who made the government, I, I've told Ambassador Princeton Lima that if the CIA f found in my house some papers of discussions that I had in internet to form a government here in the United States, I think that they will call me to justify it. I think that it, because, that because, these individuals that I told you that were arrested here in the United States, these three individuals, they also were having discussions on the internet. So that's very discussable. If uh, someone found it, the, the authorities now, they now know that the government was not made by the individual that are arrested, but was made by other individual, but in court. At the moment, how will they know? And Raphael told us that he was not allowed on the court, because I think that if you follow this case of these 15 plus two individuals, the courtroom is not bigger than this room. It's normal, it's our court. We have to respect it. If Raphael, if you didn't have a place to sit, where the court will put you? On the floor? No. I was the first to arrive. No, 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 that's not true. I was there and I saw that you are not you the first. Not yes, there. I was there. I was there and I saw that you were not the first to arrive. So, as I, as I told you, as I told you, Raphael takes things personally because, and we understand that he's a. Uh, he's, uh, is a 
How can I become an activist? He is an activist and he is making his job and the government respects Rafael and respects the other activists. We are, we, the lady uh, posed a question on opening FM frequencies in Angola. Rafael, one more time, you are not talking the truth. Angola is the only country in Africa, notice very well, the only country in Africa where the biggest opposition party has his own radio. UNITA has his own radio. It's called Radio Despertar. And broadcasts freely, uh, people hear to this radio, and you know that, Rafael. That is part of the peace agreement. Yes, but it, it has helps. nothing to do but with freedom of expression. It, it, it has to And do. it only broadcasts in Luanda. No, no, it's not only Luanda. Yes, of so course, it only, if, it's FM. If, no, 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 no. We have repeaters. So if, 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 uh, if, the, if you have an intention, and we have been seeing radios appearing in Angola all years. These years we have two more radios opened. So I think that this is a debate that will take us many hours or many days uh, to, to make. And I, I thank Ned for inviting us, for having me. I thank Ambassador Priston, Mr. Todd Haskell, and the Secretary. I thank also Rafael, and I thank you for hearing me. And I hope that I can be invited for more debates here in Ned or here in the United States. Thank you so much. Thing, I, 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 I want to thank our, our professors. I just want to come back for a moment. I'm sorry to hold everybody for just a couple of minutes. I want to go back to, to something Rafael said in his opening uh, remarks about the choices ahead for Angola. One is to sort of move along in the same system that's been operating. Uh, and governments can do that. They can do it for so long. Uh, uh, with a heavy emphasis on security and 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 worries about uh, press and other ways of keeping uh, control, but those cost the country a great deal, and they don't necessarily can't be sustained forever. The second option, which Raphael proposed, was a national dialogue. I, I would say that that's the first step, but I think. Going back to something Raphael said about, you know, the government is concerned about uh, opening that dialogue because of past uh, 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 corruption, et cetera. That has to be on the agenda, too. That transitions take place when you work through issues of impunity, et cetera, in a way that permits the transition to go forward. It takes all sides to do that creatively. And I think for Angola, which has so much potential, and but has a number of the issues that we've discussed today embarking on that kind of process maybe with help from from organizations or from the state department etc it won't be an easy dialogue but i think it's necessary rather than to fall into what rafael said was the third which the things began to fall apart and that would be the worst of all so i hope this is just a tiny bit of a thought of how we this dialogue can open up in a very fundamental way with a lot of issues on the table and then how everybody can move forward uh, in Angola. So I want to thank you all. This has been very candid. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Dave Peterson, Pierre. And thanks you all for being here. I apologize for holding you a little bit late, but I hope you'll give uh, thanks to our participants. Thank you very much. <laughs>